Hi everybody and welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is part three of four of our conversation with Dr. M. David Litva of Virginia Tech talking about personal deification. Last time we talked about the kings and gods of the ancient, the kings and emperors of the ancient world as gods and what the political ramifications of that were. We talked about the Gnostic cosmology as an act of political defiance, and we talked about where in the New Testament uh, the Jesus actually considered divine or not. In this episode, we're going to talk about ordinary people and can they become divine themselves. We're going to talk about theonomy and how God gives his name to people and what that means in terms of personal divinity. And Simon Magus, we spend a bit of time talking about him, one of our favorite folks here on Talk Gnosis. And then we close things out with a conversation about Yeldabaoth and how his self-deification affects the uh, personal deification that we all experience. So stick around and watch all of this episode, part three of four of our conversation with Dr. M. David Litva of Personal Deification. So Dr. Litva, uh, we've been talking about these, these special divine figures, you know, kings, rulers, uh, you, Jesus. Uh, we haven't really talked about ordinary Joes becoming divine. Uh, is, is there ideas, like even in the Bible or in, say, a leading question, uh, the letters of Paul about how how normal people can become divine or, or become uh, experience this theosis? Well, <laughs> it depends on what you mean by divine. Usually a god is going to be defined by two basic properties. A god is going to be an immortal being with superhuman power. And if you can combine both of those, typically in the ancient world, you can be categorized as a deity. So in the Garden of Eden story, Adam gets only one of those characteristics. He gets a power of knowing good and evil. But in order, to, in order to prevent his full deification, Yahweh removes him from the tree of life, which will prevent him gaining immortality. I think what Paul does is he gives believers both gifts, but he gives it to them as so often as chiefly an afterlife scenario. He believes that the believer in Jesus is undergoing a present transformation. And it's a transformation enabled by spirit, which exists within us and is transforming us from within. And we are gaining a kind of power through that spirit. But the second element, immortality, is only going to be an end time or eschatological gift and we are going to eventually have our bodies more or less cannibalized so to speak by the spirit who is going to transform our outer flesh into a spirit reality and we are going to then not exist under the conditions of entropy or decay and this will occur either at the so-called parousia or second coming of Jesus or, um, well, it will definitely occur then for both the dead and the living. Um, so it's something that we have to wait for. But in spirit form, once we attain spirit form, I don't think there's any doubt that we would qualify as deities who have both superhuman power and immortality. This is one of the things that Nietzsche complained about Christianity. He said, you know, that immortality used to be something grand, but now every Peter and Paul can get it, <laughs> and you have diluted the, the true heroic Greek mentality and given it to the masses, and that is why your religion is disgusting. But, of course, from the Christian point of view, that is why the religion is grand, that we have now have a democracy of gods within a larger theocracy. Um, and and, and do, do you think this, is, this would be Paul's view? It just, uh, 
just when we put it in that kind of terminology, it sounds almost shocking to modern many modern years, right? If I went into, I, I believe many churches, and I'm not dumping on any church, but many church, and and said, you know, Paul said we're all going to become gods. It'll be a democracy of gods. I think there's kind of a monocle falling out. <laughs> uh, but but do you believe that would be his his perspective? That's how he would view it. Well, you know, Paul is going to speak in his own distinctive ways, and I I think we need to be clear, and I hope that I'm clear as a scholar, that I'm coming at it from an outsider, sometimes called an edict perspective, that I don't pretend to be representing exactly Paul's language or just re-describing Paul's language. That would be an entirely boring task. (laughs) I am creating new categories which I think are faithful to Paul's thought and which I think expresses true meaning. But I don't say, I never have said, that Paul speaks in exactly this kind of language. But I think in terms of the realm of antiquity, deification is what I call a native category. That is a category with which people were familiar with. And if someone comes in and preaches a message of immortality, the reception of a spirit body and superhuman power, then he is preaching the gospel of deification, even if those words have not been invented. Mm. Uh, 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 oh, go ahead, Father. Well, I was just uh, I was thinking that there was uh, a couple of uh, digressions that could have happened at this point, but maybe should be <laughs> saved for other shows. But I'll say them out loud anyway. Um, the uh, we had. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, Richard Hodges on the show a couple of weeks back, and uh, to talk about Gurdjieff. And one of the um, one of the things we talked about is the immortality of the soul, and whether or not that is an innate quality of every person, or if that's something that can be that or is or it has the potential to be, I should say, developed over time. Um, and, and whether or not that deification is something that is uh, something that happens to all people or all believers or just those people who worked really hard at it. Um, kind of a, a, a topic maybe for another time. And, um, and the other one has gone from my brain, so maybe it'll come back <laughs> later. You know how that happens. <laughs> uh, uh, Father, actually, I'll let you take the next question on the sheet because I don't know how to say that word. Theonomy? Is that the one? The- Yep. <laughs> so what's theonomy? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it depends on how you're spelling it. Oh, okay. um, I'm, I'm spelling it with a Y. Um, and what I mean by that is sharing a divine name that mm-hmm. often deification in a Jewish way is expressed by the idea that God gives his name to people. And this is more than just a cute metaphor for, you know, now your name something else. It's a way for God to share his power because his name represents his authority and his status and some would say his very being. So in the case of Jesus, and I argue in the so-called hymn in Philippians 2 where Jesus receives the name above all names, clearly not just some kind of cute perfunctory ceremony that's a mere formalistic no when he gets the name of god then he becomes god and his status is actually clearly raised and this is a clear example of deification or deification tradition in a particular jew with a particular jewish local color being applied to jesus so theonomy means that application of the divine name to a human being, which is a mode of deification. Yes, and I'm reminded of, um, we, we talk a lot about, uh, internally we talk a lot about Margaret Barker and temple theology. And uh, one of the points that she likes to make is that the high priest is called Yahweh, is, is called the divine name, and actually mm-hmm. takes on the... Um, either you know exists as Yahweh on earth or kind of takes on or you know in um, invokes Yahweh into themselves mm-hmm. um, as part of that and so uh, I yeah, think that language is pointing idea. directly to, to that tradition mm-hmm. absolutely and again it's just 
it's a Jewish way of expressing this transfer of power and status, and in some cases, being. And so, yes, they don't use the language of deification. Yes, that's a later linguistic development. But it's definitely there. It, they're using their own local expressions for it. But mm -hmm. they, yeah, they have their own way of putting it. But that, it's, that sense of the investment of supreme power in an individual, that's participating in God's divine energies. That's participating in a clearly superhuman power and status. That is deification. Sorry to interrupt, but we need your help. Talk Gnosis and all of the shows on the Gnostic Wisdom Network are free and will always be free, but it does cost us a lot of time and money to actually make these shows. So what I'd like to ask is that if you have enjoyed our programming, if you've found something useful uh, about it, if you've been educated, please consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash Gnostic. We've got a whole bunch of new shows that we'd like to start making, but we can't do it until we can start to support ourselves a little bit more financially. And um, we really hope that you will assist us in our goals. Uh, we've got a great show coming up about sex and spirituality with uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart from Talk Gnosis and his wife, Sarah Beale. Uh, we've got The Lost Word coming back, esoteric Freemasonry and fraternal orders and initiate, initiatory orders and all that kind of thing. We've got Temples and Tentacles uh, with some weird fiction authors, kind of Lovecraftian spirituality stuff that I think you're really going to like. Plus some really interesting kind of fictional and... Um, uh, kind of entertainment based things that we want to do that also have kind of an esoteric and Gnostic educational component. So please, uh, we need your help to make all of this possible. We have big dreams, but we don't have a lot of resources to make those dreams a reality. So please do visit patreon.com slash Gnostic if you haven't already and uh, pledge. You just give a small amount of money uh, for every educational media thing that we put out. And then at the end of the month, your, your card gets charged. You can set an upper limit so that you're, ne you're never surprised by uh, too many things getting charged on your card per month. It's really very easy and very painless, and it makes a huge difference to the Gnostic Educational Ministry of the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and all of us here who work so hard to bring you this, um, what we think <laughs> anyway, is pretty great content. So if you agree, that's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Sorry again for the interruption, and back to the show. Getting into the more gnostic -y part, I mean, in my opinion, the whole show's been pretty gnostic -y. <laughs> But more specifically, uh, who is Simon of Samaria, and, and why do you call him a self-deifying hero? Well, Simon of Samaria is... I would call him, um, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, more or less a highly mythologized figure, just as Jesus is a highly mythologized figure. That is, we may be able to reconstruct a certain core about this person as a historical human being. Um, but that's not the point. The point is that we have a figure who seems to, in my opinion, be Christian uh, and live or do his ministry in the area of Samaria, which is just south of Galilee, and who, according to tradition, by means of his speculative insight, realized that the divine fire was something not boxed up in some fourth dimension, and separated from the world, but that the divine fire was spread all throughout the universe and exists in seed form in the human heart. Mm -hmm. A coming to a, a superhuman consciousness that is awakening our superhuman consciousness, essentially God wakes up within us and begins the process of evolving into the absolute deity that he truly is. 
And so the, there's a Trinitarian idea that there's a God who is uh, in seed form, a God who is developing, and a God who is in a state of fullness or perfection. And it's Simon who believe, who it seems to be the first person to realize that he is in and part of this larger process of awakening divinity to its true self and in that process realizes his own divinity. Not because it was an arrogant claim or that he was a megalomaniac or that he was an evil heretic, but because he realized that this process of God coming to fullness and consciousness involved himself and his own transformation of consciousness. Now, according to later tradition, uh, Simon was vilified as the first heretic and the creator of the Gnostic movements. This, of course, is a tragic and disgusting misrepresentation of who this figure actually was. And one of the points in the new book dealing with self deification is to show that actually Simon and Jesus, as depicted in the Gospel of John at least, are radically parallel figures. And it's a case where, again, I wouldn't say that there's winners and losers, but there is a Simonian, there are Simonian Christians and there are jo Johannine Christians, and they are in a kind of competition. And in the end, they're borrowing ideas from each other. And both communities, neither community wins, both die out. But it just so happens that we have preserved the Gospel of John in the New Testament. And the only Simonian document that we have exists in the Refutation of All Heresies, which I talked with you when I was here last time. Mm -hmm. It is the only genuine Simonian document written in Simon's name. I don't personally think it was written by any historical Simon. But like the Gospel of John, it was written by a community who venerated the founder as a, de as a deified figure. And it tells Simon's philosophy or theology, and it is one of the most beautiful pieces of literature, of Gnostic literature anyway, that we possess. It's called The Great Declaration, or the Megali Apophasis. It's in book six of The Refutation of All Heresies. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah, I think a lot of our um, a lot of our viewers and listeners will be familiar with uh, with that figure specifically. Yeah, he's a he's a kind of a favorite around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Father, do you want to take the next question? Yeah. Another another favorite who comes up on the show a lot. Sure. Yeah, and also, well, okay. Yeah, let's do this next question, and then I'll come back. Um, so we talk a, a lot about Yaldabaoth on this, uh, if, if that's how one would pronounce it, on, on this show as, uh, as the demiurge um, of, of the Sethian uh, mythos. Um, what, uh, what does he have to do with self-divinization? Well, that's a great question. And I, again, in the, in the new book, he gets his own chapter. Uh, I pronounce it Yaldabaoth. Uh, it's... Uh, is a fascinating figure. Uh, the point that I try to make about this figure is it, it's very clear that in Gnostic tradition, he, his chief sin, his chief blasphemy is to say exactly what Yahweh says in the Hebrew Bible, that I am God and there's nobody beside me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in other words, the chief sin of this figure is to create a universe where it's exclusively monotheistic, but the whole premise is a wicked lie and based on an arrogant claim of a really ignorant or ignoramus deity who is more or less a kind of adolescent anyway, but is depicted as an abortion or a miscarriage of divine wisdom. Now, what I think is the important point, for me anyway, about this figure is that he makes the same claim that God makes or Yahweh makes in the Hebrew Bible. So it's clear that the Gnostics are parroting um, Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible. And 
but there, it, it's interesting that when people read Yahweh saying, for instance, in Isaiah, I am the only God, there is no God beside me, and worship me alone, they try to defend him and say that, yes, well, you know, he's right. Uh, he is the only God, and we ought to worship him and, and give him honor. And the Gnostics basically turn this on, on its head and says, don't you see that this is the most arrogant claim that anyone could make? <laughs> and it is inherently false because he doesn't have all the power. And there is something in us which tells us that there, the tyrant who runs this universe, the demonic infrastructure and bureaucracy, and leads us into all, you know, to fulfill our commercialized lusts and ignore the important things in life, the great questions about getting free and true freedom, not just, you know, what kind of toothpaste I can <laughs> freely choose at the supermarket, but I mean true freedom. The God who is trying to prevent that is telling a lie that we know to be a lie because we have the divine spark and the divine power within us. And so we know that anyone who claims to have all the power and to be the only God and to not allow any participation, not allow any deification, that being must be the primal liar, the father of lies. Because we experience it in our own selves. We experience divinity within us. And it's by virtue of that experience that we know that any force in this universe who tries to take that power away from us, who tries to say that we're just dust, that we're just nothing, that we're just particles, materialistic, you know, materialistic philosophy, which says that we have no soul, that we are only electrical impulses in our brains, and there's only the natural world, and cog, we are cogs in this vast wheel, and we will die when the sun dies in two billion years, and in five billion years, there will never be a memory that the human race existed. That kind of <laughs> basic philosophy is a lie from hell. And it's the Yad Abeo character is the one who shows that because we know he's lying. But it's he, so it is parroting Yahweh. But it's, it's not the true Yahweh. It's not the true God. The Gnostics aren't saying that God is a lie. They're saying that there is a true God who shares his divinity, who is beyond name and beyond knowing. But there are these other divinities, these other powers in, our, in this world who come in and say, no, we have all the power or we have all the money, I guess in American culture, <laughs> and you people are nothing. You 99% have nothing. You're not worth anything. That's the lie that I think these Gnostics are trying to expose, and they expose it through the character of Yaldabao. I'm not a man.